the least racist person, the least racist person that you've ever seen, the least. I am the least racist person that you've ever met, believe me. To say, is Donald Trump a racist? I am the least racist person that you've ever looked at, believe me. The least racist person. The least racist person that you have ever met. I am the least racist person. I'm the least racist person that you've ever met. So many of my friends who are black, they say, you are the least racist person. But no, I am the least racist person that you have ever talked to. I am the least racist person you've ever met. almost like cold words that the president uses, but he always uses it when <clears throat> there's other turmoil. And so when he made his first uh, immigration comments the other day on live TV, when he said that the bill should be crafted with love, he, he got uh, crushed from his base, talking about he was going back on his word, that he was allowing amnesty. So today gave him a chance <clears throat> to show that he was tough and that he would get rid of the diversity visas and, and stop all the people from a shithouse like Africa from coming over, when the facts show that if you're talking about attaining college degrees, African immigrants do a much better job than everyone else. So we're not talking about facts, we're really talking about emotions. And I think that he is one of the best in the world at dividing people and distracting people from the real issues. And that's the unfortunate part about it because we're not talking about dreamers tonight. We're talking about racially insensitive comments, racist comments, coming from the President of the United States, as opposed to how do we keep government running past the 19? Mm -hmm. How do we fulfill the promise to the dreamers? Uh, we're distracted, and I think that that was his ultimate goal. Congressman Richmond, I appreciate your time. Thank you. The President has repeatedly said he is the least racist person ever, including on this network when he was interviewed by Don Lemon during the campaign. Take a look. You I am the least racist person that you have ever met. I am the least racist person. Back now with the panel, Mark Lauder. Um, you work closely with the Vice President. I cannot imagine the Vice President of the United States ever saying anything like this. Can you? Well, I mean, let's, let's be honest. This is not Nickelodeon. And, and there was a story on CNN. I don't know what that means. Uh, but uh, can you salty, imagine the Vice salty, President? Salty, I'm, I'm salty, asking you, can you imagine the Vice President, the man you work for, uh, ever saying anything like this, yes or no? That, that's not the kind of language that the vice president would use, but let's be honest, this is salty language. This is going back to presidents, going back all the way back to Harry Truman. Well, there's salty and there's racist. Do you believe this was racist language? Uh, what I believe is that the president is talking about his immigration goals for our country, which is mean it's not no where you're black from, people from Africa are. or Haiti, correct? No, that's it's not where you're from, it's who you are. He wants it based on bringing in the so best So why is he talking about right whole countries? He's talking about why are we bringing in large numbers of people just by, based on where you are from, not who you are. We're so he's talked about merit-based from the beginning. He wants America to attract the best and the brightest. He's not talking and about countries, he's, he's talking about the entire continent of Africa. What he was talking about was is talking about a merit-based system. I mean, I looked up just a few minutes ago before, we, before I came in, Norway is the seventh highest educated country in the world. Why would we not want more people from Norway? Not because of the color of their skin, but because they're highly educated. And, and, not, and, not, have, and not have more black people from Africa? Because, I mean, as, as I think it was to Bakari's point, uh, college education levels are actually very high. Van, college education levels are actually very high from African immigrants. And, and the president is talking about having a merit-based system, not based on where you're from. But this is crazy. This is insane. The, the fact that we're having this conversation with educated people on national TV is insane because you don't understand the fundamental values of diversity. I mean, you don't understand that people who come from different parts of the world to the greatest country in the world bring various tools. They have different value. And yes, if you can't sit here and rebuke the comments by the President of the United States, if this was a merit-based system based on some intellect, then I'm going to sign up to deport Donald Trump. I mean, listen to this. What are we talking about? People who come from Nigeria, people who come from Liberia, the, the Cameroon, South Africa, Tanzania. Look, they bring value to this country. We've had poor immigrants from Ireland come to this country, but I don't hear anybody talking about them. We've had poor immigrants come from white countries. No one's talking about them, but you want to bring somebody over here who wants to bring their intellect or maybe wants to work with their hands, but they want to bring value to the United States of America, and you say no because they're from a shithole because of the color of their skin? 
But in many ways, and we're well, saying the same things. I mean, I think we all want America to remain that place where everyone in the world wants to come. And what the president is saying, that we have to prioritize people based on a merit-based system. That's why he wants to go and reform it. And again, he's saying there shouldn't be carve-outs, and I went through the list before, shouldn't be carve-outts for Norway. Shouldn't is there be any white, the UK, predominantly white, is there any predominantly white or Caucasian country that the president has called a shithole? I haven't had a no. full conversation on every well, place. Well, no, I'm just world. asking you. Uh, there, there, is, to your knowledge, is there is no there. predominantly white country that the president has called a shithole. But, I mean, we know he doesn't like Muslim like, countries like here, or Central here. America or Mexico, but look, and but now it's back the entire Anderson. continent of Van's Africa point. as well as no. Haiti. I'm just wondering if you can name one country that has a problem, that has a majority Caucasian population that the president doesn't want people from that country. He wants he wants the best and the brightest, and you're trying to make this... No, a, I'm a waiting for him to say, outrageous. you know what, there's some problems That's in Norway, there's some problems about. in Sweden. I mean, it, 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 the idea that he picks Norway is... is because he met with the leader of Norway yeah. yesterday. So what, the last guy in the room, that's what was on his mind? Anderson, but, 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 and and he, also, he also said Asia. I mean, it's, he can't it, it, it happened to be both Anderson. ways. But okay. you're asking for it both ways as well. He happened to see no, it no, yesterday, so it was... Let me say a few things. Oh, right. Jason, he Jason, also said yeah. Asia. Anderson. He generalized to the entire Asian population that those would be good people to have in this country as well. I mean, again, that's racist. But Van, if, if there are higher levels of politics, I have the floor. One time, one time. Please, Van, go ahead and then. Van. I, I have the floor. Um, so here, here's what, what, what I want to point out. Uh, whenever they try to defend what Trump has just done, let's, let's just have an honest conversation. They don't talk about what Trump said. They say we only care about individuals and merit and all this great stuff, which nobody can argue with. Unfortunately, that is not what the president said. And so, yes, I, listen, we, we, we can argue about the that diversity the visas. About. But hold, hold on a second, I'm talking. We can, t we can talk about uh, whether you know, diversity visas, which you know, Bakari and I are for, are better than skills-based, et cetera. That's a rational conversation that grown people can have. That has no, the, the word shithole would never come up in that conversation. And the fact that we are here now almost in, you know, through the first half hour of this show, and no one from this administration has come on and said, no one should call any country a shithole. No one should call a continent a shithole. That that is a bridge too far. Tells you something about the character yeah. of the Trump movement at this point. I've got to take another quick break. We're going to continue the conversation. We'll be right back. You take care of it. Richmond, the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, he was just on our show. Uh, he tweeted, uh, he said yesterday that this is further proof, in his words, that uh, the president's Make America Great Again agenda is really a Make America White Again agenda. I want you to react. Well, I, listen, that's, that is Cedric Richmond, who is from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which is my hometown, and I will let his words stand uh, for themselves. And listen, as I said, all you have to do is look at the evidence. But here's what, what bothers me about what has happened, especially over the last couple of days, because this has been happening for the last few years. I mean, he's been, he started with the birther movement in 2011. But when, when, it's when someone comes on our air and says, well, I don't want to call someone a name, I'm not a name caller, because uh, we have more important things that we have to attend to. Well, for people who look like me, and for people who look like Cedric, and for people who, um, who look like Cornell, and for women on, on uh, uh, for Caitlin, and for Muslims, and for people who are underserved and minorities, we don't have that priority. It is important, that is the utmost importance to us, to be able to get a job, to be able to be, to, to be treated equally under the Constitution. That is a priority, to, and a pretty high priority. So we don't get to prioritize uh, racism and discrimination at a lower level. So I, I'm sick of people coming on our air saying, oh, there are, we have more important things to attend to. No, this is important as well. And the other people who, who say, well, I don't know what's in someone's heart. I don't know what's in a Klan member's heart. All I know is what the evidence shows, is what they tell me. They tell me that they're racist, or they show racist behavior, they exhibit racist behavior. And guess what? Even some people who are in the Ku Klux Klan don't think that they're racist. They think it's their right to be treated better than other people. They don't think that that's racist. So it may be a possibility that this president, it doesn't matter if it is or not, this president may not know the degree of his racism. Can I add one thing to that? I felt today that some reporters, some White House officials were telling reporters dismissing this as kitchen table talk, much like when they dismissed his, he himself dismissed his Access Hollywood comments as locker room talk. But the president is not 
at a kitchen table in this situation. He's in the Oval Office sitting at the Resolute desk meeting with lawmakers on a very serious issue such as immigration, making these comments while making very crucial decisions that are going to affect a lot of people. There's breaking news, more breaking news we're following. I want everybody to stand by. Important, uh, important uh, note for our viewers, you can hear a lot more from Don later tonight. Some some uh, funky money that may have passed through the National Enquirer. That was my high. next question yeah. for you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. At the Wall Street Journal report then makes a very direct reference that another large sum, $150,000, might have been routed through uh, the, the, an entity owned by Donald Trump's very good friend at the National Enquirer. Right. Uh, right. Your analysis of that. Well, they, 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 quote, hired her at the National Enquirer uh, to write some things uh, for $150,000. As far as I know, uh, writing had not been a big part of her previous uh, uh, career experience. And uh, they never published, I don't know if she wrote anything, but they never published anything. And, of course, the, the, head, the, head, the head of the National Enquirer has been very close to the Trump camp for many, many years. Uh, Howard Feynman and Donna Edwards, thank you both on this developing... Max, the Trump denial that doesn't add up. The president trying to spin his racist comments, but is anyone buying it? Plus deafening silence. Where is the Republican leadership on Trump's vile comments? And breaking news this hour, the Wall Street Journal reporting a Trump lawyer paid $130,000 to a porn star to stop her from discussing an alleged sexual encounter with Trump. Something the White House and the woman are denying tonight. Let's go out front. tonight, the height of hypocrisy, President Trump honoring Martin Luther King Jr. today, less than 24 hours after his racist remarks in the Oval Office, he, when he said a host of countries where black and Hispanic people live are s-hole countries. The president refusing to answer reporters' questions about the comments, which have, frankly, rocked his presidency. Here he is. I mean, it's incredible to think that that happened in, in, in real life. Now, the, the president is trying to pretend that there's nothing to see here, and I'm going to get to that in a second, because today, people in the room confirmed what Trump said. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, who was in the room, told his fellow Republican Senator Tim Scott that the president's remarks as reported are, quote, basically accurate. Graham also confirming in a statement that he confronted the president about them, saying, quote, I said my piece directly to him, the president, yesterday. The president and all those attending the meeting know what I said and how I feel. And here's Democratic Senator Dick Durbin, who was also in the meeting. You've seen the comments in the press. I have not read one of them that's inaccurate. To no surprise, the president started tweeting this morning denying that he used those words. It is not true. He said these hate-filled things, and he said them repeatedly. Yes, as Senator Durbin says, the president did get on Twitter 15 hours after the news first broke, and frankly, after spending the night trying to tweet about other completely unrelated things. So he gets back on 15 hours later to try to muddy the water. Tweeting in part, quote, the language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. And then there was another tweet where he tried to say that he didn't really say all that about Haiti specifically. The operative line in this tweet, quote, made up by Dems. I have a wonderful relationship with Haitians. Probably should record future meetings. Unfortunately, no trust. Again, as we just pointed out, a Democrat and Republican in the room have both confirmed his statements. And Republican Senator Jeff Flake shot down the president's assertion in the tweet that his language was tough. But no more by tweeting, quote, the words used by the president as related to me directly following the meeting by those in attendance were not tough. They were abhorrent and repulsive. Notice Blake says those in, the, in attendance, plural. Now, a source is telling Jake Tapper that Trump referred to people coming from Africa as coming from S-hole countries, but did not refer to Haiti specifically as an S-hole country. That source says Trump asked why the U.S. needs more Haitians and pushed to take them out of the immigration deal. Okay, when this is the best defense you can mount, you have a problem. No matter how the story is spun, nothing changes the fact that Trump's comments were racist. His own spokesperson didn't deny anything that was reported, including the fact that S-hole countries included Haiti and El Salvador. But frankly, we don't need to rely on Dick Durbin or Lindsey Graham or anybody else, because we know the president uses hateful, disparaging, and racist language. 
That's why this is such a huge story. He does it so often and so consistently that it is now impossible to deny that there isn't a problem. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. I think Islam hates us. Oh, look at my African-American over here. Look at him. Are you the greatest? We're building a wall. He's a Mexican. If you are saying he can't do his job because of his race, is that not the definition of racism? No, I don't think so at all. You had some very bad people in that group, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Negotiating with, with Japan, negotiating with China, they say, we want deal. You were here long before any of us were here. Although we have a representative in Congress who they say was here a long time ago. They call her Pocahontas. 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 I call her Pocahontas, and that's an insult to Pocahontas. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. People have birth certificates. He doesn't have a birth certificate. Now, he may have one, but there's something on that birth, maybe religion, maybe it says he's a Muslim. Why do you want to include the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus? Well, I would. I'll tell you what, do you want to set up the meeting? Do you want to set up the meeting? No, no, no. Are they friends of yours? Get I set up the meeting. Maybe we say politically correct or not politically correct. They don't look like Indians to me, and they don't look like Indians to Indians. Jeff Zeleny is out front tonight in Mar-a-Lago in Florida, where the president landed just moments ago. Uh, and also, by the way, to add to one more historic uh, iconic re uh, uh, reality, I think it was the Lady of Freedom on the ca top of the Capitol building was also put there by slaves. Anyway, your thoughts, Jennifer? Um, I do agree with Joy that the most shameful thing, because unfortunately we've gotten used to and we have accepted and we know that this president is a racist and, to quote his own staff, a dope, um, is the behavior of the Republicans. To have Mr. Cotton and to have Mr. Perdue jointly say, we have no memory of this. How sniveling of that, yeah, how cowardly is that? You either remember something like that or you're gonna just cover for him. They know it's wrong, they won't say it, and they won't even have the guts to keep their mouth shut. They have to kind of weigh in to well, like bolster Durbin, him up. Durbin said he used that term a lot. Yeah. How do you forget that, really? Well, I would hear it anyway. Right. Uh, <laughs> Eli, you gotta, you got to be the anchor person here on this conversation, because I don't know what you can add at this point. Oh, I don't really know what there is left to say at this point. I was in that room today when the president was reading from a piece of paper the remarks about MLK and yeah. ignoring the shouted questions at the end. And it was really, I mean, it was another surreal moment in this presidency to sit there and to know the context, to know that this is a comment that he made yesterday, an incendiary racist comment, and to see him there today extolling the virtues of Martin Luther King. I mean, it's just staggering. You don't really know what to make of it. I always like to be Ben Carson and standing here. Ben Carson, whatever you think of his politics, I think he's a good guy, but he has to play this part as an African-American cabinet member. Actually, he doesn't. He could leave. Yeah. Um, and that's what bothers me as well. Not a single person... He quit. Yeah. Not, not a single person in the White House staff, not a single person who works for one of those senators who doesn't remember walks out the door and says, no, this is a bridge too far. What is the matter well, with one this? Well, one reason is there's a lemming behavior by Republicans that we've all noted here that goes beyond any of these moral questions. They seem to be marching in line like North Korean infantrymen. They just do. Um, uh, you know, uh, let's get back to that, Joy. Why do Republicans say, yes, sir? Every time Trump says do this, every time, the I tax know. bill, everything. Yeah, I know. It's interesting because, you know, there are different ways to look at it. And I agree with uh, Jennifer. Ben Carson absolutely does not have to be there. He has a career and a reputation that was separate and distinct from Donald Trump. Donald Trump disparaged him during the campaign, and now he's just as sniveling and supine oh. as the rest of them. And all of those African Americans, Trump's uh, sort of black friends that were assembled around him, Daryl Scott answering on his behalf, Katrina Pierce and all these people, they obviously are just grubbing for position and looking for something for themselves. None of them have any credibility with black people. Well, Except we them don't know. You don't well, know they're, 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 well, we know you they're don't, You just well, know that they're, they're, they're there. Call them on the Republican side. They're decorated. The worst kind of good soldiers. Yeah, they're well, decorated. Anyway. But, I mean, but, in the, but it, when it comes to people, and I'm confounded by the senators, people in a co-equal branch of government, people with their own separate dignity and constituencies okay. who represent states, why do they feel they have to bow down to this president? I truly don't understand it.
Well, the Democratic Party, not that these are two options and the only options on the table, are not like that. They don't behave anyway. As I mentioned, some of, in, in that way. Anyway, as I mentioned, some of Trump's allies found ways to defend the president's remarks. Congressman Jim Renacci, who's running for the Senate in Ohio, said the president shouldn't be judged for what he says because many often share his beliefs. Let's go. He lamented about the immigration program that was in front of him. He says, why are we taking so many people from these asshole countries? Do you, you, what's your reaction to that? Well, look, I've said all along, the president many times says what people are thinking. Um, I learned as a business guy, you have to be careful what you say because people pick everything up. I always say, judge the president after four years. Let's judge the president after what we've done. Let's mm -hmm. not judge the president on what he says. What do you think of that in Ohio, Eli? Is that going to sell with Republican suburbanites? Not with suburbanites, no. I mean, this is the same sycophancy we've seen from Republicans basically since the inception of the Trump presidency. Yeah. And it is, I mean, none of this is really... New. I mean, the, the language was shocking yesterday, but none of this is surprising. This is who Donald Trump has been and who has shown himself to be over decades in this country. And he was elected uh, largely by a movement that was fueled by okay, which his unsubtle brand of, of which religion white identity, identity politics. He seems to accept Norwegians are okay. Yes, and white, going, southern yeah, white Southern evangelicals who are southern. continuing to applaud him. And by the way, talk about shameful. These are people who are religious leaders saying that this is appropriate language? I mean, it's disgusting. But the Norwegian thing is important because that takes away any fig leaf that the White House could have used to say, oh, he didn't mean that it wasn't meant to be racist. When you're basically saying, we don't want people from those countries where black and brown people are, but we'll take people from this Nordic country that's all full of white people. It's explicit. It's clear what Trump is saying, and the White House really didn't push back very hard. It reminds me of that Saturday Night Live skit about this remember, a Secretary of State in Florida wanted to be assigned to a, a healthy country. <laughs> anyway, that was ridiculous. Anyway, this is real, though. Meanwhile, House Speaker Paul Ryan called the president's remarks unfortunate. Let's watch. Yeah, I, I read those comments later last night. Uh, so first thing that came to my mind was very unfortunate, um, unhelpful. Whether you're coming from Haiti, we've got great friends from Africa in Janesville uh, who are doctors who are just incredible citizens. And uh, I just think it's important that we celebrate that. Senator John McCain issued a stronger rebuke in his statement today, quote, respect for the God-given dignity of every human being, no matter their race, ethnicity, or other circumstances of their birth, is the essence of American patriotism. Our immigration policy should reflect that truth, and our elected officials, including our president, should respect it, Jennifer. You know, how pathetic is Paul Ryan? How far he has fallen? And he says it's unfortunate. You know, it's unfortunate when I get a hangnail. It's unfortunate when I get a run in my stockings. This is not unfortunate. This is outrageous. And look at this man who was fairly well respected, who, by the way, has been pro-immigration his whole life. Now, trying to play it down. Well, you know what I think he's going. Let me go to join us. I think everything Paul Ryan hears or thinks about has to do with his agenda. Yeah. It's not very personal. It's all about this sort of Ayn Rand objectivist That's goals right. he has, less taxes, less government, you know, less entitlement programs, you know, it's that, that's yeah. his goal in life. And yeah. anything that advances that is fortunate, anything that doesn't advance that is unfortunate. unfortunate. He doesn't care about these moral questions or these, uh, these issues of what, how we should talk as Americans. I agree with you. There has never been a more single-minded politician than Paul Ryan. He cares only about eviscerating the social safety net, repealing the 20th century, all of the New Deal, the Great Society wants all that gone. And it is true. He is pathetic. I think it's one of the darkest sort of chapters in the Trump era is, is, is there the Paul Ryan revealing himself. But I do have to say that what that other person that you played uh, on Fox News said is true in a sense, because Donald Trump will did. If you go back and you look at the data on the election of Donald Trump, racial grievance was really a driver of getting him across the finish line. He, he played to people who have what they want to call economic anxiety, but he supplied them a cause for their pain. He said, if you're losing your job in Janesville or in the plants in, in Pittsburgh, it's not because your employer is greedy and wants to export your labor to overseas workers. It's because of brown people. It's really, you should yeah. go ahead and feel good about blaming Mexicans for your woes. That is actually a big component of his base. And anybody, any Republican looking to get elected or reelected in 2018 understands that racial grievance is a big part 
of the driving sort of force behind Republican voters, yeah. at least that voted for Trump. And they know that, and they're afraid to anger those people. It's like the old LBJ quote I read today that said, if you want to get the white working class, just tell the worse off white people that they're better than the best of the black people, and they're going to feel better about their lot, and also feel better about right, voting for rich people as they yeah. basically take their money. Anyway, the president has a history of making these kinds of charges and these remarks. I've been saying this for about ever since we heard of Trump as a presidential candidate. Let's take a look. Trump comes along and said, birth certificate. He gave a birth certificate. Whether or not that was a real certificate, because a lot of people question it, I certainly question it. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. He's a Mexican. We're building a wall between here and Mexico. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. His wife, uh, if you look at his wife, she was standing there. She had nothing to say. She probably, maybe she wasn't allowed to have anything to say. We have a representative in Congress who they say was here a long time ago. They call her Pocahontas. Uh, look at my African-American over here. Look at him. Are you the greatest? I don't know anything about David Duke, okay? I don't know anything about what you're even talking about with uh, white supremacy or white supremacists. You wouldn't want me to condemn a group that I know nothing about. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Ah, uh, videotape. Anyway, additionally, this wasn't the first time the president showed such callous disdain for the country of Haiti. The New York Times reported in December that during a June Oval Office meeting, he said Haitian immigrants, quote, all have AIDS. That's according to one person who attended the meeting. However, the White House denied it. Anyway, here we go again. I want to go back to Joy this weekend. I think this story has legs. I would expect you'll be getting to it tomorrow with AM Joy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the big question on the table now is really, in a sense, for Democrats. Because how do they continue to sit across the table from this man? Uh, the question was asked when he hired Steve Bannon, given the white nationalist leanings of Breitbart and his own personal sort of views, why Repu white Democrats would sit across the table from him then, or after Charlottesville, or after a myriad of other incidents. So the question is whether or not there can be good faith negotiations with such a person, with Stephen Miller still whispering in his ear, and still, uh, you know, with, with the Attorney General's views still whispered in his ear. And I think Democrats need to make a decision, make a gut check here, whether or not it's worth sitting around that table with this kind of a man, given that he has no. now put his racist views on the table. I'm betting on the Republicans to be Republicans, Joy. Yeah, they will. The Republicans will <laughs> fall in line. As you said, they're the North you. Korean Perfect. army marching behind the cheerleaders. <laughs> Every time I see those pictures of that uniformity and regimentation, yeah. I think of the Republican caucus of the Senate. Anyway, yeah. thank you, Joy Reid. Thank you, thank Jennifer Raymond. Thank you, Chris. Raymond. Uh, columnist. <laughs> Not a conservative call. We're going to be equal around here. Eli Stuckel's great objective journalism. Coming up, what is the rest of the world here in Trump's vulgar language about countries he doesn't... Ask your doctor if Colagard is right for you. ...home advisor, Ken. So to find and instantly book a background... Right, right, but I said, as I said, yeah. Ryan. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, an issue, we, we've heard from some. You know, um, there are some Republicans who are stepping out... Um, Senator Langford and, and Tim Scott uh, mm -hmm. writing statements, doing op-eds. And these two, and they're a very interesting pair, they have these Sunday conversations trying to heal issues of, of the racial divide uh, with mixed uh, uh, communities coming together in someone's home. The big question for these uh, Sunday conversations for this pair, this senatorial pair, is if, you know, would you have someone from, your, from another race in your home? And what they do is they practice this uh, Sunday conversations issue, and I mean, they have been coming out, but the leadership, I mean, and, and Tim Scott is a leader, he was, he was one of the core four when it came to tax reform, but you need the leadership to say something. If Donald Trump, no matter if he's, as the NAACP says, he's racist or what have you, he is the president of all America, and he says he's the president of all America, not his base. Not Trump land, not white America, not rural America, not, not just the forgotten men, but all America who includes black, brown, Jew, Gentile, Protestant, and Catholic. So the question now is, what will be done to leverage, uh, like uh, the NAACP president just said, what will be done to leverage to make sure that all the leaders, not just the president, but those on Capitol Hill, make sure they understand that the black and brown community are to be looked at and to be helped because the black and brown community still have the highest numbers of negatives in almost every category in this nation. 
And, and Pastor Burns, it is clear, not only is there no apology coming, uh, but the president, uh, as is his usual way, is trying to muddy the water and, and fight back. Well, you know, first of all, I think we should, you know, um, understand who all was in the room. Um, you know, the president has already said he uh, did not say it. And let me just be clear. You know, I don't use the language, nor would I, so, uh, you know, would be uh, um, pushing anyone um, or supporting anyone that um, would, would speak derogatory of, of a country. And I like to know which which Africa country he actually called it an asshole, uh, supposedly called an asshole. But the thing is, we weren't in the room. We only used an information based off of people that were in the room. There were right, other people two in Republicans the room, Democrat, Republican were, in the and, room. And there were two Republicans that White were in House the room. White House hasn't denied who, it. Right, and, and there were two other Republicans that was in the room that clearly stated that they don't they don't recall at all the president saying oh, that. So, I mean, I, mean, I don't recall to, So you have to admit, happened? that's pretty pathetic. You either recall or you don't recall that happening. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, they're, that deni be they, they're <laughs> denying. They're denying that that the president said it. Let me just say that they are denying. They clearly are denying that the president said that. No, they're and not. The then they should come out and deny it. They're not. The only way they're not denying it is that they the would be liars, and they're the not the willing clear is, to go that far, Pastor. Well, no, the, the, the clear is that they've clearly stated uh, that they. It, it, I'm sure if the president would have said asshole, <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is, we're focusing on the fact that he allegedly said asshole about some countries and. It, 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 in my but, but mind's you, Aaron, view, can I ask he's something? talking about, let, let me finish, April. In my mind's view, he's talking about if he said asshole, which I, 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 don't, I, I can't say he did or didn't, but, but others in okay. the room, and I have it on high authority that he did not. But if he said asshole, he's talking about countries well, that is clearly... The White House is even it, denying it. it. The president himself but, but is even president denying president it. He's trying to say that it was about... Let me finish my point. Let me finish my point, because I can't get to the next point. Let me finish my point. If he said asshole, then he's ta he was talking about countries that are clearly those governments that are clearly are not taking care of their own people. There are people who are suffering in Haiti. There are no, people no, no, who... No, no, there, no, no, there are no. governments that are corrupt in those areas, and yet they want to come over here. <laughs> and, and, and No, no, we want a policy Aaron, that's going to allow yeah. Uh, okay. Immigrants Pastor, to come here to actually offer something that's very good to America. Aaron, April, please respond. Aaron, okay, first of all, I have uh, two questions. One, as a pastor, the least of these, for that to even be in the air, as a pastor, do you find offense that? And two, when you talk about, yes, Haiti is the is the poorest Western uh, nation, uh, Western uh, hemisphere nation, but at the same time, what about some of these African countries? All the continent of Africa is not devastated. Now let's look at sub-Saharan Africa. Let's look at South Africa. You can't just say all the all the countries on the continent of Africa are derelict or, or don't have any kind of democracy. So your statement is wrong there. No, no, no. So, I didn't say all of I, Africa. I, I, said I said which countries. I said which countries he called that. Now I know Nigeria. Nigeria is one of my favorite countries. They're not desolate. There are some desolate people there, but they're not desolate. And now, as a pastor, let me ask you a question. The Bible says because you, you, you talk in my lane now. The Bible clearly says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse and number I, I, 8. I've, I've that, grown up in church, so let's be clear. Praise, let's, God. Yeah, go God. praise God. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, and I'm happy, I'm happy you grew up in church. The Bible says in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8, that a man that does not take care of his own home, his own home, their own people, is worse than than an infidel. We have somehow here, forgotten here, here, that in America okay, that we are okay, becoming okay, okay. the country of the Holy Let me get a 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 I'm trying to even remember what I was going to say, but I think you're talking about the government, that, that what you just were quoting was about the government. We're talking about the people that are coming over. So for, for what you're basically saying is that if you come from an asshole country, that, that you're an asshole person. No. That, that's, that's not correct. Even if we, but this country is filled with people who came from terrible countries with terrible governments right. and they fled here and they came here. Those are the exact kind of people I would think a pastor would be saying we would want them to come to the country and they've been exactly. major contributors right. to this as country. A pastor, as a pastor, my job is to shepherd. Yes, feed the homeless. Yes, feed the poor. Yes, help them raise themselves up. But the but thing is, the it is not the responsibility the of the United States of America to be the country of the whole Africa. entire world. It is our job to empower those Pastor leaders Burns. to raise their own people up. Now, what you're saying that President Trump Pastor has clearly Burns. stated, let me finish though, President Trump has clearly ran on a Make America Great Again principle, principles. Make America, there are black people in America that
that are suffering. There are minorities in America that are that has a low interest rate home. So we're talking about we should be focusing okay. on the well, unemployment rate in African American communities that is at an all time day. high in the history of the unemployment. Your interaction with the president today because I think it's important in light yeah. of uh, what Derek Johnson just said. Yeah saying it's very clear he's a racist. You asked yes. him these questions uh, after the MLK yeah. speech here. Is your exchange, well, here's the question. Mr. President, will you give an apology for the statement yesterday? Mr. President, did you refer to African Asians? Did you refer to shit war movies? Mr. President, are you a racist? Mr. President, Mr. President, will you respond to these serious questions about the statement? And he did not respond. And April, I want to make a point. He loves to respond. Today, no. Yes, he does. Yeah. The silence was deafening. He had a chance to say something, to come out and smack me down, say, how dare you, or something. He chose not to. Um, his silence was deafening. And once again, it's in the air. And, and maybe like Gloria Borgia had been uh, reporting, that he likes this. But what does it do for, for the African nations? What does it do for descendants of Africa who are here? What does it do for diplomacy? What does it do? And I'm going to go back to Pastor Burns really quick. You know, the Bible also says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Yes. It doesn't quantify or qualify my next door neighbor or in Africa or in ourselves. It doesn't quantify love Absolutely. thy neighbor as thyself. So he is the moral leader. He is the moral right. He sets the tone. And if a president of the United States just disregards that serious question, and it was very hard for me, to ask that question of a U.S. Sure. president today when he was doing this pro uh, proclamation. Sure. But I had to ask, and I stand by it. But you have right. to remember, he sets the tone. Yes. And I, I hear what you're saying about taking care of home, but it's also love thy neighbor as thyself. Absolutely. Right. And the thing is, we're not, the thing is, we, the, 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 the ongoing, ongoing support of, of countries like um, Haiti, ha Haiti uh, from America is a clear indication that the United States government and President Trump desires to help our neighbor. Back. That we are helping our neighbor. Right, I don't, we I don't are know how the back. Let, 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 back. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. We're talking about empowering. You, you're trying to get, you're trying to give people fish. President Trump is trying to teach you how to fish. It is not the responsibility of the American government. I, I will understand you. Fish. I will understand you if we will leave those people to desert to die. No, we are giving aid. We are giving support. We are trying it, but it's their job. They are not Americans. They are Haitians. It is the President of the United States job to lift up the people of the United States of America and not the whole entire, uh, whole entire right. world. So yes, love okay. our neighbor. Give them help. Don't leave them to die in the wind. But it ain't their, our job to make everybody well. They're trying to become okay. a part of the American dream. Thank you. It's not our job. Thank you all. And next, amid the outrage over Trump's racism, is in a meeting about the possible immigration deal with lawmakers. Now, confidence, of course, I need to emphasize, uh, lawmakers in the room have confirmed, he said. Trump tweeting in part, quote, the so-called bipartisan DACA deal presented yesterday to myself and a group of Republican senators and congressmen was a big step backwards. Wall was not properly funded, chain and lottery were made worse, and USA would be forced to take large numbers of people from high crime countries, which are doing badly. I want a merit-based system of immigration and people who will help take our country to the next level. Out front now, Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate in California, Kevin DeLeon, who is also a California Senate leader and former senior economic advisor to the Trump campaign, Steve Moore. Senator DeLeon, let me start with you on this basic question. What do you say to President Trump's call for a merit-based immigration system? By the way, one that many countries that uh, America admires already have, Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, among them. Well, Aaron, what I'd say is that the Statue of Liberty doesn't say send me your richest, your smartest, as well as your <coughs> whitest people. Uh, that's not what America is all about. Um, I can tell you this, as the youngest child of a single immigrant mother with a third grade education, uh, my mother, who worked her fingers to the bone and who contributed greatly to this country by cleaning other people's homes and taking care of the wealthiest, how do we have a merit-based exclusive program in place back in that day? I can tell you this, I'd never I would never become the leader of the California State Senate. And that's what's magical about this country and about America. We are a great country already because of our diversity, not in spite of it. Steve, what's your response to that? Well, I agree. I agree entirely with that. I mean, I think our our diversity and our uh, immigration heritage has been one of the reasons that we're the greatest nation on this earth. Immigrants make gigantic contributions to this uh, country. So you're not Most you're not for a switch to merit-based. Sorry. 
So, so are you for the president's uh, desire oh, for yeah, American basis? But I also, yeah, I, I am. And I think most economists are. I think, Aaron, I think you would be for that too. By the way, we're not talking about um, eliminating the family-based immigration system. We will still have a, uh, a system where uh, you know people can bring in their children and so on, and that's that's the, always been the basis for our immigration system. But but we have, I think we should also move towards a system where we we want we get the best and the brightest and the hardest working people all over the world um, that will benefit we Americans. Do. These people do we already they already, already come here? I mean, look at look at our tech companies. Look at people like Kevin Delion. We get the best and brightest exactly. people in this country already. They do. Look, I'm pro, but but Aaron. Um, the question is, you know, we are a sovereign nation. We get to decide who comes into this country. We're not going to admit everyone who wants to come. And why not have a system where we take people with special skills, talents, whether it's in technology, whether it's in business and finance, entertainment, sports. I mean, this is what makes America uh, a powerful nation, is that we do have an opportunity to take the Albert Einsteins. That doesn't mean we're not going to take uh, people who are maybe refugees or people who have family connections. But so, by the way, I, I have to say this. I think it is somewhat racist to say that the only people who have talents and special skills and are great in technology are white people from Europe. I've been to I've been to Silicon Valley. I've I've seen the people working in those laboratories. They're Mexicans. They're El Salvadorans. They're Chinese. They're Taiwanese. It's just because you have a merit-based system doesn't mean it's racist. So so let me okay let, let me make a point here then, uh, Senator Delian, on this. You know the president has made it clear yeah. right that he wants to shift it. Right, he wants more merit and 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 less family, less chain. I guess right. he doesn't want to eliminate it, but he wants a lot less, right, yes. Senator? All right, so chain yes. migration, just so viewers understand, that's families and extended families coming to the United States. Here's the president. Right. We're going to as quickly as possible get rid of chain migration and go to a merit-based system. Chain migration is a disaster for this country, and it's going to end. Chain migration is a total disaster which threatens our security and our economy and provides a gateway for terrorism. All right, from what he said there, I think it's pretty clear, and I want to make sure I, I <laughs> clarify what I said. He wants to get rid of it completely. And this is important, Senator, because if you look at the numbers in 2015, Justin Hartley's bride... Oh, look. That's Mitt Romney accepted his endorsement. CPAC had him show up, though he was pushing a nutty conspiracy theory. So I think he's been enabled by Republicans, and the election only taught him that he can get away with saying the worst things. And even Paul Ryan, during the campaign, when he was talking about Mexicans being rap uh, rapists, and when he went after an American judge for a Mexican heritage, Ryan said these are racial issues. Yeah. And yet, he, he succeeds, and he's only learned up to now, up to this week, that he can get away with it. It seems to me it's an old, uh, an, an old excuse. It's a tackling dummy for him, Barack Obama. But let me ask you about the embassy. Of course, the American embassy, those of us who have been lucky to see it in Grosvenor Square, is in a beautiful part of London. It is a wonderful, leafy neighborhood. You want to wander around there. Who wouldn't want to wander around that neighborhood? But in cases like there or in Nairobi, because of security concerns, they have moved the U.S. Embassy out into somewhere outside the city where they can put the bunkers up and put all the cement up. You know what's going on. But isn't that exactly what Trump demanded in the, in the aftermath of Benghazi, that we should be tougher in putting up our defenses around our embassies and diplomatic facilities? Isn't this what he wanted? It was it was not a decision, again, I think part of the problem is this was not a decision that President Trump made about the embassy. It was, again, a George W. Bush, Bush decision, but the president has a lot of frustration about <clears throat> inheriting problems from his predecessors. That's something he's voiced repeatedly. He's complained <clears throat> about it on North Korea. Um, and, and so while it fits in line with him wanting to secure Americans abroad, um, Again, it wasn't his decision, and flank, frankly, it seems like a little bit of a flimsy excuse to get, just get out of a visit to London that was not going to be particularly enjoyable for him. And it's not, it's not even a problem. I mean, you can moving the embassy was judged by security experts that <coughs> it was necessary. So, and the embassy is being yeah. built. It's not you know it's not plagued with with issues. So he's he's creating a, a problem that doesn't exist. So he can blame Barack Obama. It is for the peanut gallery. It's for his most far right people who will buy yeah. anything he gives them. So tonight, Friday night, when they're sitting around talking about Trump. They'll take his side and say, well, you know, they had a problem with the embassy. No, we didn't. The Trump's problem is with Trump.
Thank you, Ashley Parker of the Washington Post and David Corner of Mother Jones. Up next, this was the week President Trump was supposed to push big reviews. Wow, welcome back to Harvard. That was President Trump basking in the glow of his lengthy televised immigration meeting this past Tuesday. For a short time, it seemed to dispel some charges from Michael Wolff's Fire and Fury book about his very fitness for office, but it didn't last long, did it? Trump started the week with that show of deal-making on immigration only to reverse course the next day. Let's watch. I feel having the Democrats in with us is absolutely vital because this should be a bipartisan bill. This should be a bill of love. Truly, it should be a bill of love, and we can do that. But it also has to be a bill where we're able to secure our border. We don't need a 2,000-mile wall. We don't need a wall where you have rivers and mountains and everything else protecting. Would you be willing to sign an immigration deal that ultimately does not include funding for the border wall, or would that be a red no. line for you? No. no, it's got to include the wall. We need the wall for security. We need the wall for safety. Well, on Thursday, the president complicated matters by ranting to senators about immigrants from S-hole countries being allowed to enter the United States. He also tweeted criticism of a surveillance reauthorization bill. His own administration was lobbying Congress to approve, then reversed course two hours later. In a lengthy interview with the Wall Street Journal, Trump said, I probably have a very good relationship with Kim Jong-un of North Korea. But when asked about his combative tweets, Trump told the journal, you see that a lot with me, and then all of a sudden somebody's my best friend. I'm a very flexible person. What a week. Let's bring in the hardball roundtable. Ginger Gibson, political correspondent for Reuters, Karine Jean-Pierre, senior advisor for MoveOn.org, and Beth Bowie, of course, our own senior politics editor at MSNBC and NBC. Beth, I want to start with you. Uh, he seemed like he was on a sort of parole this week, proved that he's not as nutty as, as Michael Wolf said he may portrayed him as being. And he, he stuck to that for a day, and then off the, off the rails. Yeah, but see, and I think if you're referring to that bipartisan meeting he did in the Oval Office where he invited cameras in, yes, he was trying to show that he could function, that he could run a good meeting, that he could seek input, he could sound plausible and, and, and defensible as a president. I actually found the whole conversation, though, a little bit off, because Michael Wolff's central thesis was not that the president is, is nuts or, or mentally unstable. It's that he, his staff he, do not believe he is up to the job. And that very much was borne out in that meeting. He did not know anything about the substance of what he was discussing on DACA. He simply was saying he, he wants a deal, any deal. He was ready to take Dianne Feinstein's offer of a clean DACA if necessary, just to get the deal. And it took Republicans to step in and say, no, 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 that's not what you want, Mr. President. He also sort of dealt with this, this meeting as a TV producer, and this is mm. content. And as the cameras were leaving, he said, I hope I gave you guys enough material. So it was as though he was producing a show about a presidency rather than actually executing the job. That's how he fixes a problem. He, and he also referred to Karina as a uh, studio. A studio, exactly. the cabinet room. His studio. Yeah, the presidency is a reality TV show for him. I mean, that's the way he's kind of taking this all on. He did that with, as a candidate. He's doing it now as president. And the, the other thing, too, I totally agree with uh, Beth's analysis. The other part that I would add to it is that every time they say, and that's not me, they say that Donald Trump uh, is going to turn a corner, right? He's going to, he, he really is going to be presidential. Days later, we see the real Donald Trump. He can't help himself because he is truly who he is, which is, there is no mystery to him. Why do you is, think, uh, if you think, do you think he's politically smart? No, I don't think Why he's Why would he say in front of I, Durbin and a bunch of Democrats, a lot of progressives like uh, Durbin, I guess, why would he use that term, asshole? I can't even say on television, but he said it, he gave them what they wanted, which is something they use against them to be political about it, right, Ginger? I think they're going to use. They're going to. By the way, how's he going to get a Democrat to cut a deal with him on immigration mm -hmm. if he made those comments about the people that are involved? That's absolutely the hardest part. We're in an even number year, which means these people have to stand up to voters this year, and Democrats are going to say the last person they want to be seen making a deal with, even on something that they want, yeah. is going to be Donald Trump. I think that when we see him say things like this in a private setting, there is a bit of a thought that he's the president, that he can do these things. Things, that, that he can muck it up behind closed doors because yeah. he's in charge. Um, it's a little bit of a, of, a, of a fairy tale version of a presidency that Donald Trump had coming into it that we still see coming back up that he thinks that it's okay. Uh, you got to cover the straight news for us, but tell me, where's he stand on DACA? Do we even know? He wants a deal. He wants any a deal, deal, any deal. He said, just send me something that I can sign. 
You guys work out the details. He he did he did tweet quite a bit this morning about that he can't he will not accept a DACA that doesn't um, address chain migration, this you know family okay. migration. Also, he wants the wall. He wants but the other wall. than that, he's he's pretty flexible. And notice the Washington Post is starting to give him the wall. Very interesting in their lead editorial the other day. Anyway, last night we have to lighten this up a little bit. Last <laughs> night I asked Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe how he would respond to provocations physical in 2020. Remember this memorable moment, by the way, during the second presidential debate. Where look at this weird performance by Trump. He walks and he looms behind Hillary Clinton. Then he notched it up by getting closer to it when she was trying to answer. Quite, no, no, there we go. This is spooky. Now, okay, so I asked Terry what he, the governor, what he would do if, if, if Trump tried that on him. What would you do yep. in a debate with him if he tried that? If he come over and leaned over back of you, what would you uh, do? You'd have to pick up. You'd have to pick him up off the floor. Usual. <laughs> You saw at the very beginning of the administration, just about a year ago, that more than 1,000 Foreign Service officers uh, took part in a protest. It was inside the government, but a protest against the president's Muslim ban. So this president is defying the basic foreign policy that we've had over the last 70 years in terms of how we treat people, whether we believe in immigration and refugees or not. You know, Aaron, this is the greatest refugee crisis in the world right now since 1945. Yep. 63 million displaced people, and the president doesn't want to take a single Syrian refugee. He wants to cut immigration in half. He wants to zero out all refugees in 2000. He did in 2017. We haven't had a president like this. So he's challenging all the people who have to serve him, and I know that people are trying to serve him faithfully, our career diplomats. Thank you very much, Ambassador Burns. Thank you. President Trump once again vehemently denies any such occurrence, as has Ms. Daniels. Cohen released a letter purportedly signed by Daniels denying having any sexual encounter, though Daniels herself could not be reached. And a White House official said, these are old recycled reports which were published and strongly denied prior to the election. Trump is accused here of paying hush money to cover up an adulterous encounter. He is not, in this case, being accused of non-consensual behavior. Though he is on record bragging that his fame allows him to commit sexual assault. And he's been accused of sexual misconduct by at least 25 women. Joining me now, Michelle Goldberg, columnist for the New York Times. Several interesting things about this, Michelle. One of them is Michael Cohen releasing a statement on this woman's behalf, not using her real name, but using her stage name, Stormy Daniels. There's so much about this that's weird. What, what stands out about it to you? Well, to me, the thing that stands out about, well, a couple of things. First of all, the fact that the president paying hush money to a prostitute is like the fifth least, yeah. the fifth most scandalous thing that's happened today. Mm -hmm. um, but more than that, I thought there was a line in Michael Wolff's book um, about Trump that never got the sort of play that I thought it deserved. He, in it, it's Steve Bannon going on one of his epic rants, and he's talking about how Trump should listen more to his lawyer, um, Mark Kasowitz, and he's saying because Kasowitz, there, there was, what, 100 women during the campaign, Kasowitz took care of them. And so, you know, I kind of thought, hmm, I would like to know more about <laughs> those 100 women. And now maybe, you know, this is the first of those stories, and. I would guess that more and more of them are going to tweet out, I mean, are going to come out. Yeah. You know, it's not, whatever, this is a consensual affair. It's like, you know, in turn, and this is who Trump is, right? Yeah. And so in, in some ways it's, it's neither shocking nor particularly scandalous. I think that it, you know, kind of confirms what we already know about him. But more, and then the other thing that I think is interesting is that Steve Bannon is obviously somebody knows about this. Yeah. And so if you're thinking about, well, why is the story coming out now? That mm -hmm. could be one reason. Well, maybe that's his little revenge. I mean, we, we do know there are several things that we know. So porn star Jessica Drake came forward in October 2016 to accuse Trump of kissing her without her consent, offering her $10,000 in exchange for sex, also in 2006. Uh, on November 2016, uh, the Wall Street Journal unearthed documents revealing the National Enquirer had shelled out 150 grand to Playboy Center fold Karen McDougal for a tell-all about her alleged 10-month affair uh, with the Donald from 2016. 2007 and they never ran the piece. So there are all of these instances, a lot of them dating back to 2006, mm -hmm. which I believe is, is when Barron was born. It was one year into the marriage with Melania, and it was around the same time as the infamous Access Hollywood tape. Mm -hmm. At this point, is this kind of a situation where this behavior 
it's not shocking, as you said, but it also, in a sense, kind of boosts him because part of what Trump is is the man movement candidate, right? The <laughs> candidate that's bringing back the alpha male, as Dr. Gorka likes to say. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think... I, it's very hard for me to imagine anybody who voted for Trump being dissuaded by the fact, again, that he that he is paying hush money to a porn star. I feel like, you know, they know who he is and maybe they are even impressed that that's who he is. But the um, question is then, why is it that sexual scandal can still bring down other candidates? Because even some Republican candidates, it was temporary with David Vitter, the prostitution scandal mm -hmm. temporarily hurt him. Uh, you know, you've had uh, sort of scandals about people stepping outside their marriage, taking careers down in some cases, even when it's Republicans, obviously the former governor of New York. But with Trump, it doesn't seem to stick. I think partly for the same reason that Trump's racism doesn't stick, right? I mean, think about the way that Trent Lott, you know, lost his career yeah. for, you know, the kind of comment that wouldn't even be on our radar today if yeah. Trump said it. I think it's because, again, all of this depravity is already priced in. You know, people don't expect anything more of him and so you know and, and i think that the real the real scandal will be if some of those other hundred women turn out to be instead of somebody like stormy daniels um have had experiences more akin to like you said the kind of couple dozen women who've come forward and said that they were yeah. roped or sexually assaulted by the president. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see if those women ever do get their day, uh, you know, for their stories to be taken seriously. They are in the Me Too movement as well, and I should just point out that Stormy Daniels is not a prostitute, as I think was inadvertently said. She is a adult film star. Big difference. Um, Michelle Goldberg, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, still ahead. How the racist person, the least racist person that you've ever seen, the least. I am the least racist person that you've ever met, believe me. To say, is Donald Trump a racist? I am the least racist person that you've ever looked at, believe me. The least racist person. The least racist person that you have ever met. I am the least racist person. I'm the least racist person that you've ever met. So many of my friends who are black, they say, you are the least racist person, but no, I am the least racist person that you have ever talked to. I am the least racist person you've ever met. Maria Hinojosa is the host and executive producer of NPR's Latino USA. Randall Pinkett is the winner of season four of The Apprentice reality television show and has denounced Trump's past racist behavior as racist behavior in the past. Randall Pinkett, is Donald Trump the least racist person you've ever met? Donald Trump is vying for the most racist person that I've met these days. It's interesting that he has this soundbite of saying he's not racist. I remember when uh, he was asked, how do you defend against racism? His response was, well, I hired Randall. Right? That's like saying I have my black friend. Right. So when we look at the pattern, I think people were afraid to label him a racist early on because there was some reticence, maybe political correctness. But after you look at the history, and I grew up near New York, so we look at the, you know, the, what's happened in New York, you look at housing discrimination, you look at his treatment of Black Lives Matter protesters, all of what we've seen is a pattern of racism that has just been consistently across Donald Trump's career. Mm -hmm. So there's no question in my mind he's a racist, and now I think the question is how are Republicans going to respond in light of this continued pattern, which is putting them into a corner, and I'm really disappointed in people like Paul Ryan, who, I, who in my opinion have been less and less vocal as time has progressed in denouncing Donald's behavior. Yeah, well, and in your case, he didn't even want to hire you alone. He wanted to pair you with a white contestant so that That's he right. could make it more palatable for himself. Maria, you know, we, we keep talking about the substance of Donald Trump's racist behavior, but we haven't talked that much about the outcomes. Could his pronouncements have outcomes that actually could wind up helping in some ways the DACA recipients who are in jeopardy? Well, that's very specific, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not sure, but what we do know, right, is that the DACA program was reinstated because of judges seeing an argument that included Donald Trump's racial animus towards Mexicans. Because he said that, right? We know it. I mean, it's kind of clear. It's on video. It's on video. So now the question is, is that clearly he is showing racial animus towards uh, particular people in countries, right? <clears throat> so now the question is, if that is the case, aren't there going to be lawsuits that say you cannot stop, you cannot stop TPS because you don't want people from these countries that you have labeled this? So I'm like, how far does this go? Does this go all the way to the International Court of the Hate of Human Rights? Um, does it end up in the Supreme Court? And if it ends up in the Supreme Court, 
Yeah. Right? What does that look like? But I think that there are lawyers around the country right now who are figuring out what is the legal argument here. And this was created by Donald Trump. And I think about that because, Randall, you know, you have Democrats saying, well, you know, we still need to get in the room and negotiate with Donald Trump as if that's the only way to stop his reversals of TPS for El Salvadorans and Haitians, if it's the only way to stop him from sending 800,000 DACA recipients home. But it does feel like there are other alternatives. With the Muslim ban, his animus toward Muslims that he showed in his tweets was a way to go legally and go through the courts to stop him. And it does feel like there are other measures here. You have not just Donald Trump, but right. the existence on his staff of people like Stephen Miller, who have passed instances of racial animus. I'm looking here, and I keep thinking about this essay by Michael Anton, employed by the taxpayers, working for the administration, who, when he was a blogger under this Publius Decius Muslim, wrote, the ceaseless importation of third world foreigners with no tradition of taste for or experience in liberty means that the electorate grows more left, more democratic, less Republican, less and less traditionally American with every cycle. If people like that work for Donald Trump, why is there not a case being made that this is akin to the Muslim Muslim ban. Stop him in the courts. Yes, I, I agree. I think you and Marie make a great point. I think it's time for Schumer and Pelosi and the Democrats to really rethink their strategy. You know, up until now, to your point, I think there's been this dance that's going on with the administration. Do we want to work together? Do we want to go against it? And we know how they treated Obama. Correct. They were clear from day one. Our agenda is to shut down everything this guy does. I think the Democrats really have to dig in and say, are there more sophisticated ways, whether it's the legal grounds, whether it's the courts, that can begin to pry away, if not shut down what he's trying to do, because there are some real legal challenges, which, you, which, which we've talked about. Yeah, and at the same time, just in your reporting, Maria, because there's also a real-world rebound to this inside of these communities that are watching this president speak in this way, they're getting a very clear message. So the words that I'm focusing on are actually three words, take them out. Everybody's focusing on these other two words. Mm -hmm. I'm focusing on when he said take them out, because what that means is that he's sending a signal clearly to the agents on the ground to go and do this. So that is the part where, you know, your heart is, is, is uh, clenching. But Joy, the, today, I got in a livery in Harlem, and I asked the driver, I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Senegal. I said, how are you feeling? He's like, I know, I'm like, I'm, I'm, like, I'm Mexican, I know. It's like, <sighs> then I said, but you've got American, you've got US born children. He goes, oh yes. And I said, and what? And he said, they're gonna become lawmakers. Yeah. So all of this, you know, is going to come back. And we don't know how, and it's very scary, and it's very upsetting, but this is setting in motion things that we can't even see. Yeah, for the next, uh, let's say, nine months. Absolutely, and, and also for the you know the sort of self-interest of Republicans that they clearly can't see. You, you've now had uh, the, the, the Puerto Ricans insulted, right. can come to Florida and vote. You have people of African exactly. descent, can vote. You have voters that actually can respond to this as well. Mariana Hosa and Randall Pickett, I believe I'm out of time. Thank you for joining me. Uh, that is all in for this evening. And guess what? You can see me again right here this weekend. Make sure to tune in to eight. The least racist person, the least racist person that you've ever seen. The least. I am the least racist person that you've ever met, believe me. To say, is Donald Trump a racist? I am the least racist person that you've ever looked at believe me the least racist person the least racist person that you have ever met i am the least racist person i'm the least racist person that you've ever met so many of my friends who are black they say you are the least racist person but no i am the least racist person that you have ever talked to i am the least racist person you've ever met Is Donald Trump the least racist person you've ever met? Donald Trump is vying for the most racist person that I've met these days. It's interesting that he has... Oh, no. Right? It has nothing to do with Dr. King. And not he president. did not. Not only that, not only... Right. And, and with all of that looming from the day before, and all the other things, the, the litany of issues that, you know, from Pocahontas to this to that to the other thing, it just kept building to the Muslim ban, to hearing about Nigerians, to, to, to the Haitians, and you know, recently. And then this, the, the, the S houses or S holes, whatever he said, the question was there, it was looming. And people were saying racist, and I went and asked the NAACP yesterday, what is the definition of racist? They said, when racial prejudice and power meet, and it begs the question because all of this is happening, and that is the ultimate seat of power. Mm. So, um, 
you yeah. know. And, and, and not only that, from what I'm told, from what I'm told, from what I'm told, uh, Daryl Scott, because I was walking into the room, he was uh, jumping on the reporters talking about your vultures, your vultures before I walked, because I could hear him as I was walking into the room. And when I came in, it kind of stopped. But he was determined to chastise well, someone. That's, that, well, it's, um, it's, so he was. You can see it's ignorance, and it's people who don't know where they are. And who, he is ignorant. He's yeah, very, it's, ignorant. It's very ignorant. He's people very, don't, very You're in the White House. Um, the press is there. And he's a guest, keep, and I'm doing my job. Uh, thank right. you very much. This right. is your house. Yeah. David, go on. What did you want yeah, to say? Yeah, I was just going to say a couple things, Don. First of all, my hat's off to April. Those questions were heard loud and clear. There was no Thank hesitation. You, you could hear it above all that chatter. You tried to get to the heart of the matter, April, and the president just turned his back. Um, I do think it has something to do with Dr. King, contra uh, the gentleman you said it was Daryl, uh, it was Scott. Pastor Daryl Scott, um, because if anything, Dr. King, right, was about getting to the heart of things. April, you were trying to get to the heart of the matter of what we've been talking about for the last two days, I would just add on the note of Dr. King, since it is King Weekend, that if King had been there with regard to this whole issue of immigration and where people come from, he might have said to the president and everybody there to check your Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 19 says, Love the foreigner because we were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. And all that message has been forgotten Preach. by the president and Republicans on this issue. They've gotten so far away from that. But it's not been forgotten by the president. He yeah. doesn't go to church. Okay, well, he, it's not forgotten or, by the president. Or not known. Either <laughs> forgotten or not known. But other Republicans yeah. have lost the, the, the thread of that from this immigration discussion. Um, I think that, uh, look, the president had to go through with that ceremony today, Don, I guess. But in Did contrast, he have to go through with it? Okay, well, I'm sure he thought he had to go through with that. And look, we, as you and April were saying, we saw people that we all know there in that shot, right? Our colleague Paris Denard, my friend Katrina Pearson, people were there, uh, you know, that we've been on air with. But, you know, what was that all about when you look at the bigger picture of what was reported by my Washington Post colleague yesterday, the S-hole comments, the whole discussion about the Dreamers, and this idea that uh, the president was so willing... Uh, it's weird, Don, how, not weird, weird is too cute of a word at this point in time. It's really striking and unfortunate how the president, if you looked at that clip you played, he needs notes and teleprompters when he's trying to say something decent and constructive, but when he's saying something acid or, or tart or rude or offensive or racist, it rolls off the tongue. And I think that's really where we are in this discussion. Right I just can't imagine, um, looking back at that picture, if I'm in it, history. Well, no, look, it's, it's going it, to be, uh, I don't know. People are there because they want to honor Dr. King, but the, the small event in contrast to the big discussion we're having, I think, is, right. a, is an odd mismatch. Thank you both. I appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Don. Thank you. When we come back as President Ruined America. We have never before heard anything like this from a President of the United States. Donald Trump calling African nations shithole countries, asking why the U.S. needs more Haitian immigrants and wanting to know why we don't have more immigrants from countries like Norway. All of this in the middle of the, an Oval Office meeting just one day ago on immigration. Let's discuss now. Sina Fareed Zakaria is here. Fareed, thank you. And the perfect person to talk to because you're an immigrant yourself, an American citizen. Um, what was your reaction when you heard the president call, you know, African nations shitholes? Well, I think that, you know, I assume that I actually fit into the, the same category because it's not clear what he meant by shithole countries. I, I, come, I, I grew up in India. I don't know whether India would qualify. I think it does because his basic criteria seems to be brown and poor or black and poor. So India would probably fit somewhere on that spectrum. I, I think that other than the vulgarity and the, you know this kind of just, kind of just offensive way to talk in general, I think there's something bigger here. It actually misunderstands something very crucial about America and about the American experiment, which is America has always understood that people who come from screwed up countries are themselves bright, talented, hardworking people. The reason they're not able to perform to their potential is because those countries are screwed up. The political and economic systems are screwed up. So you take people from great countries that were considered shitholes in the 19th century, Ireland and Italy, particularly southern Italy, one of the poorest parts uh, of, of uh, the, the, the world at the time. 
and you get them to America in a new system, the same people perform brilliantly. You take the Cambodian Vietnamese boat people who came out of you know this horrible situation and those same people in America thrive and prosper. You look at Nigerians. Nigeria has for a long time been a really screwed up country. They come to America and they have an incredibly high achievement. Indian Americans today uh, are, have a higher per capita GDP than almost, I think they have actually the highest per capita GDP of any American ethnic group. So, you know, that's the American experiment, which is that we understand that it's not the human being who's the problem, it was the political economic system, and once they're in America, they're going to do great, whether they're Haitian or anything else. You just debunked all of the, the fake arguments about you know people being uneducated. and uh, Don't we only want high earners? Because people in Norway, the, their median income is $97,000, and the median income is $8, or, or what have you, or $80, or whatever it is in Haiti. And it's like, so that's more of a reason to want to come to America, because people from Norway don't want to come here. And, and by the way, that's always been true. We never got the French bankers and the, and the English earls. Why would right, they? Right, exactly. We always got the poor Irish, the poor Italians. We always got people from southern Italy, the poorest part of Italy, which is by far the poorest part of Europe. And those people have drive. They have initiative. And I tell you, you know, when somebody comes here, um, and they're going through unimaginable barriers and, and incredible difficulty, and they're coming uh, you know, at, at pain of death sometimes, crossing the Rio Grande to wash your dishes, mm -hmm. to look after your baby for 18 hours a day, 16 hours a day from you know ter terrible wages. Those people have drive. They have initiative. They they and the whole American experiment has been that that's what we've been able to do. The rest of the world has always marveled at that, that right. we can take all these people from everywhere and they become productive Americans. I want to know what this means, um, wh what this means for the world, and not just, you know, it's just us here uh, in the United States who are, you know, we're sort of talking about it here, but I'm wondering what this means for the rest of the world, because the African nation of Botswana asked uh, its U.S. ambassador to seek clarification on, on Trump's remarks. They want to know if they're a shithole nation. What does this mean? What are other people saying? Well, look, everybody is stunned and startled. I think, to a large extent, you know, you're getting the, the biggest reaction from African countries. But every country, I think, in the world is wondering where they stand, how, the, how, how people think of them. In front. By the way, European nations don't like this idea because they understand that the implication is that they're good because they're white and rich and other people are bad or inferior in some way because they're black and poor. That's exactly and what he said. They, and and, and they, are, you know, they don't want to embrace that kind of language, and yet this is the United States you know, supposed to be the leader of the free world. Yeah. So I, I, I find that uh, I was surprised at the number of people who have been very diplomatic to me in the past. Pe you know, people in government, in, in foreign ministries, who were unwilling to criticize uh, Trump because he's the president of the United States. They were openly critical today. Yeah, as well they should. Because there's no excuse for, for what he said. I want to switch gears now and talk about something else. The president was planning to go to London to open the new U.S. Embassy there, but just last night he canceled this trip and he explained why. He said this on Twitter. He said, the reason I canceled my trip to London is that I am not a big fan of the Obama administration having sold perhaps the best located and finest embassy in London for peanuts, only to build a new one in an off location for $1.2 billion. Bad deal. Wanted, to, wanted, wanted me to cut ribbon. No. First, why does he always feel the need to blame the black guy for everything? And all of this is not true. Not, is any of this true? No, in fact, none of in it. Fact, none of it is true. The, the Bush administration. Well, first, why does he why does he aim the why does he blame the black guy all the time? You know, it's it's fascinating. The Bush administration made the decision. The embassy in London, if he has ever seen it, is a architectural monstrosity. The the old embassy. It was this weird 1950s clunky concrete building. Actually, one of the reasons it sold for I mean a decent but not an extraordinary uh, price is because. The estimate was that the renovation costs were going to be so great. Right. Um, the, the new embassy is actually closer to Downing Street than the old embassy. Um, it's more secure than the new embassy. Look, the, 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 I, I share some sympathy with the idea that Amer new American embassies tend to be, uh, you know, unnecessarily guarded, fortress-like. But that's a decision that, you know, it's a bipartisan decision that people have made that they don't want to be putting American diplomats in harm's way. So they all look a little fortress-like. Uh, this one is actually quite cool if you look at the design and certainly uh, the old embassy i mean i think trump may not have actually seen it because it's really not an architect may not have yeah so okay um number one it didn't happen it wasn't obama it was bush right. 
The new one is more, is safer, more secure, better looking. By the way, the, 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 his ambassador gave us has given lavish praise to this new embassy. None of this is true. Not one word that he tweeted is true. Do you guys get that? What's the real reason he's not going? The real reason he's not going is he is wildly unpopular in, in Britain. It's bipartisan, both parties. The, I, I think he was expecting, and probably correctly, uh, that there would have been hundreds of thousands of people on the street uh, and would have put him in an awkward position. Yeah, he doesn't like that. I think it would actually put, put the Queen in a very awkward position. She's hosting a state dinner for a guy and there's like 200,000 people outside Buckingham Palace protesting. So I think he made the right call. The, the rationale is entirely uh, specious. He would say they were there uh, <laughs> to see him and celebrate him. <laughs> if you, you look carefully, they're actually cheering. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Farid. I appreciate it. Don't miss Farid Dakari's uh, GPS that Donald Trump's a racist. That is not breaking news. Donald mm -hmm. Trump is right. who he is. You know, it is the underwhelming response, their willingness to go along with this, or the assumption on the part of Republicans that, in fact, this is the way Republicans think. Look, Americans are fundamentally decent people. Most Republicans are fundamentally decent people. The problem with Donald Trump is that not only does he appeal to their worst instincts, that he actually continues to move that window of what is acceptable. And you think about, from the Republican point of view, this was the week that Donald Trump was supposed to convince everybody that he was the stable genius, right? Yeah. And he yeah. ends the week talking about restricting you know, immigration from shithole con countries and paying off porn stars, and it's only the middle of January. No, no kidding. Uh, let me ask you this, Jason. Uh, Jim Renacci, Republican from Ohio, mainstreamish Republican. I think he's an accountant by trade. Uh, I sometimes have trouble getting him to stick to the truth when he's on this show, but now he's running for Senate in, uh, in uh, Ohio, and he had this to say about the president. I've said all along, the president many times says what people are thinking. Um, I learned as a business guy, you have to be careful what you say because people pick everything up. Judge the president after four years. Let's judge the president after what we've done. Let's not judge the president on what he says. Four years, I, I, my head's going to explode. It, it, it's been a year, and as, as Charlie says, on a weekly basis, you get, uh, you, you get this, this basket, this, this, this cartload full of nonsense that you have to, you have to come, pull apart. Is that a fair analysis of judge the president after four years, not on the basis of what he says on an ongoing basis? Well, as a former Ohio voter, I would definitely say no. We've, we've already seen who this president is. And, and some of this, I, I think it's important. It's, it's, you know, Chuck D, base. How, how low can they go, right? Like, how low can Trump's base go to justify what he's doing? He doesn't have to defend this president in order to be successful in Ohio. Ohio is a reddish, purplish state. But I think the real issue here and the real challenge for Republicans and people who want to save this party in the future is to realize you don't have to work with this guy in order to be a good Republican. And to the degree that you continue to justify his behavior, you downgrade the entire party. Republicans are about to become non-existent in California out of this midterm. They're losing state-level races that they shouldn't lose because they refuse to get off the crack pipe that is the racism of this presidency and recognize that there are real policy things they can do that don't have to come at the expense of people of color. Charlie, what happens? Because it's really just not a good thing for the world if the Republican right. Party uh, has, to, has to disappear from the scene. We like debate. We like the idea right. uh, that there are going to be two sides to discussions, but the Republican Party may need to save itself before the midterm elections. Right. Uh, they, they may, but the, the, the clock is running. You know, they've had numerous opportunities to draw the line, and they haven't done it. They've entered into this Faustian bargain with the president, uh, you know, and you're seeing right now the price of that going up all of the time. You know, the price of, you know, selling your soul. You get a lot of things you want, right? But it turns out to be way more e expensive. But I, I, I do think that analogy of California is absolutely correct. I mean, you're watching Republican candidates around the country, Martha McSally, who is the establishment candidate down in Arizona, twisting herself into pretzels to you know no not condemn this this sort of thing they're embarrassing themselves now there is this 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 argument that Republicans are making that look you know if you leave aside Donald Trump's tweets he's actually delivering the conservative agenda you know you're hearing that from David Brooks you hear that from guys like Hugh Hewitt all the time that you know what conservatives ought to be happy with Donald Trump what they're missing is the way that Donald Trump is poisoning mm -hmm. the Republican Party, 
poisoning conservatives. Yes, they're getting some of the things they want, but for a generation, people are going to look at Republicans and say, you stood with Donald Trump. When Donald Trump was saying these things and acting this way, you stood with him or you were complicit by your silence. And there's not going to be much of a defense to that other than saying, well, yes, but we did cut uh, corporate taxes, right? And doesn't that cover right. for, for the, these kinds of uh, comments? Jens, good to see you. Thank you for both, uh, both of you for joining me, Jason Johnson and Charlie Sykes. All right, coming up next. Inter but it doesn't matter because we've listened to this man over the past couple of years. And it's clear that he has what's called a racist bias. And this is the sad thing about it. It's one thing for him to feel that way and to say things like that over, say, Thanksgiving dinner. But to imagine that somebody would feel that way about places like Haiti or Africa that have been through so much, if you're thinking about history rather than the president as if you were some sort of butterfly or amoeba, then even if you're thinking it, you're not going to say it. The lack of control in this person, who considers himself the person with the bigger <coughs> button, etc., is truly alarming. My younger daughter is going to turn three tomorrow. She literally has more forethought than the commander-in-chief, as does my cat, as do several of my forks, knives, and spoons. It's alarming. Yes, he's a racist, but couldn't he hide it? We have a child a lower mammal running the United States. And you're listening, just from listening to his language, you can discern all of that. Because if you look at, put the, put the full screen back up, if you look at all of the things that he said, and I said, you know, is there any other way for that comment yesterday? But those are the words, and your book is called what? Words on the Move? One of them is, yeah. Those are the words. And if you read those words, what does it say to you? Well, frankly, the words that we're talking about say, that this is somebody who thinks that white people are better than other people. It's not just one statement, all of the canny sorts of things that his supporters are going to say about how you might possibly interpret the things that he said yesterday don't matter because it's at the point where we have an aggregation of insights from this man. And what alarms me even more than his lack of basic forethought is the historical ignorance. And so, for example, Let's say that you think that black people are lesser. And let's say that you're also going to talk about it in public. One thing that might hold you back from that is knowing about the history. And so, for example, Haiti and Africa, they have had many problems. Haiti had a little thing called an earthquake, for example. Immigration. So why are we taking all these people from whatever? Well, immigration is what America is based on, and generally when people immigrate, it's because where they came from had some problems. His grandfather came from the Palatinate in Germany. I assume that he didn't like being in the Palatinate. From what I've heard, nobody goes there as a tourist now. Or, another example, you're an immigrant country because when people come here, there's an argument that maybe the United States has done some things in the past that we're not crazy about, that doesn't make me not a patriot, done some things that we're not crazy about, and so there's an idea that maybe there's a certain reparation that we bring Haitians here because of certain things that the United States did in Haiti, particularly in the early 20th century. I guess this man hasn't read any of the briefing papers about that. Or there's an argument about Africa and how Europe and the United States had certain effects there. These things are debated, but one expects that the commander-in-chief would at least know that there had been a debate. And nevertheless, what he has to say is that all of these places are shitholes, and why in the world are we taking people from them? This is a leader? This is a large person? This is, um, that's what limited knowledge does. <laughs> yes. No, seriously. If you don't know those things, then you can, you can come to some sort of fast conclusion that, well, yeah, he's right, those countries are that way. But why do you think they are that way? Have you ever thought about that? And that's what, that's what research, reading, history, instead of sitting in front of the television and getting your, your news from one single source, or reading only, or listening to the radio to one single source. And that he's supposed to reflect. He's supposed yeah. to think he's supposed to protect. Dumb as a box of air. Don, you know what? This is, this is what I think. As of that comment yesterday, we must bond <laughs> this country. And in 2020, we must make it so that this racist, yes he is, dim-witted, mean-spirited troglodyte goes back to the shithole life that he was leading before. This will not 
do. Wow, okay, <laughs> your words. Uh, listen, I have to say that the president does acknowledge tough language. Um, it, he's, he's acknowledging that he swore. But as a reaction has poured into these comments, have you been struck by people who aren't really upset by the obscenity and the underlying message that is so dark against the ideals against the country which this country was built on? Well, you know, I haven't been struck because I know that for many of these people it's an issue of priority. And so as long as uh, Trump is going to bring America back to this wonderful thing that it supposedly was, as long as he's going to keep certain immigrants out, he's going to build a wall, and he's going to give poor white people jobs in Ohio, as long as all that is in there, then anything that he says is just kind of impolite. I understand that issue of priority, but frankly, those people are wrong. We have a responsibility in this world. Humanity does progress, and I'm afraid that this person goes against anything that we would call progress. This person shouldn't be president, and his defenders are looking weaker by the day in their sense that anything that he does in terms of impoliteness and stupidity and nastiness and even possibly blowing this planet up is okay because he wants to bring an America back that most of them never lived in and know nothing about. John McWhorter, thank you. Thank you, Don. Appreciate it. When we come back, many... Hey, then we just insulted all 54 countries at the same time. Absolutely. When you do polling survey around the world, it's Africans who still think highly of the United right. States, whereas other countries have gone way down in their support for America, Americans, and certainly for the President of the United States, where only Russia and Israel are the only two countries with still half of the positive view of the President have gone up, not down. Uh, so, yes, uh, we have just turned ourselves upside down. And, you know, China shouldn't get a free ride. They bring in Chinese workers. They don't share their cap capacity. They don't share their technology. They don't share skills. Uh, they do it all of themselves, and that's burnt a lot of African economies. So we have opportunities here that we're not taking. I think the other thing I want to say, Ali, and I started to say it this morning, is that there was a very famous uh, German uh, Protestant pastor during uh, the time of Hitler. At the beginning, he supported Hitler. At the end, he ended up in a concentration camp for seven years. He said of himself that he was anti-Semitic to begin with, but he wrote a very famous poem, and to quote it in this instance that we are facing now, and this is what America has been about, speaking up for people on behalf of people's rights, that uh, I... Uh, First, they came for the Salvadorans, and I did not speak out because I was not Salvadoran. Then they came for the Haitians, and I did not speak out because I was not Haitian. Then they came for the Africans, and I did not speak out. I was not African. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak. Yep. We've got to speak up. Poignant way to end it. Ambassador Wendy Sherman, thank you for your analysis today. Later, a last one. My reaction, well, I appreciate you bringing up that statement. I'm a veteran Army Ranger from the 75th Ranger Regiment. I had the honor of serving. Uh, so, you know, I do, I was very much offended by that statement. Uh, politicians say the darndest things. Uh, and Donald Trump is, is now a politician, and he is one of those people saying just the most what absurd, ridiculous things. It? Do you think Somalia, what Sudan, uh, and other uh, <laughs> countries that send people here, or, uh, that send their people fleeing, do you think they're paradise? Do you want a vacation there? I mean, tell me what you're offended by. Are you talking about uh, Donald Trump's comments from yesterday? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you were talking about Durban. Yeah. What, what, what's what's yeah. your thought about those countries? Well, uh, my thought is just he, the, the recklessness that he uses when he says these things. Uh, my, my main concern, I, I, as a veteran, I've got a lot of friends that are Trump supporters. I'm concerned because that, that statement however you cut it, came out as overtly racist to a lot of people. Overtly? There are How so many racist? friends of... There are How so many... How is it racist to say a it country came out is, that way. Is, is, is tr it came out that way because the media wants to fulfill the narrative. Because they said... Jason on well, this. Because, Jason, Jay, hold on one okay. second, we'll get back to you. Jason, they've been playing the race card over and over again. I submit they're out of ideas, your reaction. No, I, I think that's right, and pardon my voice here, uh, fighting a little uh, a sore throat, but... Uh, no, it's the only thing they have. Look, there were six members of Congress in that room. There's only one Democrat, and only the Democrat is saying that this has happened. And I think it's highly suspect when Dick Durbin, who has a history of doing this, I mean, he said he used this card on, on Republicans before, 
was absolutely wrong. And I think it was a German philosopher, Nietzsche, who said, I'm not upset that you lied to me. I'm upset that I can never trust you again. And that's the reputation that Dick Durbin has earned in this situation. And I, it's just absolutely wrong what he's saying when the president is saying, no, that didn't happen. Oh, and, that, and, and all the great results for the African-American community as well. Gentlemen, sorry the segment's short, but by the way, Trump is defying the experts again. The latest great news for the economy as well as the latest hypocrisy from the Hollywood Me Too crowd. Up next. Tell me within a million people how many illegal immigrants are in this country. Not within a hundred or a thousand or a hundred thousand. I'll tell you one thing. You can't tell me. I'll tell you one thing. I don't know the number, but within I know this. I know here. this. No matter how many illegal people, if you want to call them that, are in this country, they're not our biggest problem. They're not the boogeyman that you guys are talking well, they about. Are, they are illegal. I'll tell they, you, they I'll tell you what. They're, they're, not they're, not who's creating, they're not who's creating the crime in this country. They're not stealing jobs from people the way you want people to think. They're no boogeyman. They're no boogeyman. They're people. Of they're taking jobs. A lot of them Look, are like your ancestors and my ancestors, maybe two generations ago. That's right. Corey, that's who they're uh, like. Chris, and you're making course. them sound but, like but, but they're some preachers forget. from the Black you, Lagoon. That, that's no, the I'm truth, not. my what brother. Is that's what's going on with this conversation. And we both know it. So you want to build a wall, fine. But now you're not going to build a wall. You want to have a safe border, that's fine. Everybody wants a safe border. But that's not the way this talk started. It was ugly, and it was scary, and it was xenophobic. And now, to get a deal done, that's all going to go away, and we should be okay with it. I think you've got to remember what people no, said. Chris, remember why they look, said it, Corey. I, I, I remember, but what I don't even know, we, can't, we don't even know within a million people how many illegal immigrants right. are in our country. That's a problem. That's, the, that's literally no question. the population of the state of New Hampshire. No we need question. to do a better job. We need to do we a better job. We need to find out how many illegals are here. We should know the who's here and who is. Accountability. You're absolutely yes. Right. We but should. That, that wasn't the original sales pitch. So let's find a way pitch. to do that. But let's see what deal they come up with. And I'll tell you what. I'll end this on good news for you. I think the president's going to get his deal, and I think he's going to be able to say that he's going to get a wall out of it. I think the Democrats are going to cut that kind of deal. Why? I have no idea, but that's what I think is going to happen. I'll track it. You're welcome back whenever you want to discuss these issues, my friend. Thank you, Chris. Be well to Thank you. Thank you. All right, Corey Lewandowski, everybody. So the president has gone from a very stable genius to slamming countries in just five days. When will the GOP finally speak some truth to power? We have Rick Santorum versus Ben. Room with the president. Lindsey Graham told him that President Trump said some version of what has been reported about that blank hole uh, comment related to immigration. Last night when this broke and I came on your show, White House aides were not denying it was said. But two other Republicans today who were in that meeting, Senators Perdue and Cotton, said they do not recall the conversation playing out that way. And the president himself, who knows what he said or didn't say, tweeted, quote, the language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. What was really tough was the outlandish proposal made, a big setback for DACA. He added, never said anything derogatory about Haitians other than Haiti is obviously a very poor and troubled country. Never said, quote, take them out, made up by Dems. I have a one wonderful relationship with Haitians, probably should record future meetings. Unfortunately, no trust. Now, as the president held an event at the White House today to commemorate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, various pundits and anchors at places like CNN flat out called him racist, while various officials inside foreign governments, ranging from Haiti to South Africa, also attacked the president. But that may play right into what White House officials told us last night that the president's more concerned about border security here at home and protecting Americans than what foreign governments have to say about his policies. The bigger question for the president's agenda is whether this episode makes it even harder for him to accomplish the already tough battle of getting the wall along the southern border included as part of a deal on DACA. As Republican Speaker Paul Ryan today said these comments were unhelpful and Senator Dick Durbin, a key leader in terms of rounding up Democratic votes, flatly claimed the president said it. Whether you're coming from Haiti, we've got great friends from Africa in Janesville uh, who are doctors who are just incredible citizens. And uh, I just think it's important that we celebrate that. And then he went on and we started to describe the immigration from Africa that was being protected in this uh, bipartisan measure. That's when he used these vile and vulgar comments. Durbin and other Democrats not expressing much outrage, though, about controversial comments about immigration from House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi. She said the immigration talks are led by, quote, five white guys, which sounds like the five guys fast food chain. 
the five white guys, I call them, you know. And, um, <laughs> I said, are you going to open a hamburger stand next or what? Well, one of those white guys is Pelosi's number two in the Democratic leadership, Congressman Sandy Hoyer. He rebuked her. He said it was offensive. A sign this already volatile debate is getting inflamed, Sean. All right, Ed Henry, thanks so much. Uh, we're gonna, you're going to stay with us. We also bring in former White House press secretary and Fox News contributor Ari Fleischer. Uh, Ari, you were commenting on this last night. Now, I'm just asking as an irredeemable, deplorable human being that clings to God's, my Bible, I believe in the Second Amendment, and my religion. Um, a lot of things are said in politics, but what do you make of the conflicting views? How do you, where do you come down on it? Well, here's where I come down, Sean. I, I believe in addition. I believe in being inclusive. I believe in welcoming people to this country and that we should get the votes of Hispanics, African Americans. It doesn't matter who you are because our ideas are the best and we can help lift people up. But if you're a Hispanic, if you're African American, you hear the president talk like that, you wonder if he cares about you. And that's the problem with words like that from the president. He might be speaking you know, from the gut, you know, the kinds of things people say privately. He lets it rip on occasion, and sometimes it's helping to be politically incorrect. Other times it pushes people away, and, and I can understand that. That's why I've said that what the president did I thought was hurtful. I wish he hadn't said it, Sean. I said that yesterday. I still think that tonight. You know, uh, he, as you were saying in your report that he admits he used tough language, well, let me move on. Because you know, this really all comes down to the immigration debate. It seems like chain migration will end as part of this. It seems... Um, inarticulate, not whoever said what, well, we'll let the, the Washington people figure it all out, but he's talking about a merit-based system from what I understand, yeah. the way I understood it. At least it. the debate is shifting that way. The wall seems non-negotiable for the president, and DACA seems to be a part of the deal if the wall is included. Yes, but I mean, one of the problems with the negotiations that the president referred to in his tweet is that this started out, what, how do you define DACA? It started out as the children of illegal immigrants brought here through no fault of their own should stay here. The current state of negotiations has changed. It's those children plus their parents who came over here illegally and knowingly so, not the infants, not the kids, they will get some sort of legal status as well. To be clear, they're not going to become citizens overnight. This is not an amnesty per se. However, they will get some legal status. That's not where this started, Sean, and that's going to upset the president and others who support him. Ari, I, I make this point often. You, you always get the spending increases. You never get the tax cut. You can go back to 86 in the Reagan deal. You always get the consideration, the amnesty. You never get the wall built. And, and interestingly, uh, and I played it the last couple of nights, all the Democrats sounded like Donald Trump only five years ago. Yeah. What's different now is that you have Donald Trump running the government for at least the next three years. So if Congress does appropriate funds for the wall, the wall will be built. You'd have to believe that Donald Trump won't build the wall if he's given the funds. So that's the key. The so he's got to be given, this is important. The money the money's he's there, be the given... rest is up to Donald Trump and his administration. He's got to be given the money as part of any deal, or he's making a mistake. And I would, I would think, show me the money, to quote a famous film. And look, and, and you know I'm a, I'm a fourth immigration reform Republican. I 100% agree with what you just said. You've got to get the money for the wall. I would not vote for a deal for DACA without funding for the wall. The two should be tied because Republicans are 100% right. We'll be doing DACA 2.0 in two years if we don't have better border security, and that includes a wall. It could also include mm -hmm. sensors and drones and more border patrol agents, but a wall works, and a wall should be part of it. The wall should be built first. Ed. Uh, no doubt about it that that's something the president's demanding. But the Democrats like Dick Durbin have simply not, you know, given an inch on that. And they, when you, I talked to a White House official in the last 24 hours who was saying that their frustration with the president's comments, they don't believe he's a racist, but they said, look, we were getting momentum here in these immigration talks, and this may stall it. This may take it into, you know, the back and forth about the president's personal views. Do so you of think the, the Democrats want DACA so bad? They do, but they think that they can get DACA five, without the wall. But, but they might five be wrong. years ago, they wanted, they wanted 700 miles of border fence. They did. You had Dianne Feinstein on camera in California Chuck Schumer saying, saying that uh, they're, they're taking away our Medicaid benefits. They're flooding the city. I mean, Democrats said this, many of the same things as President saying now. Now they call him racist. Back then, somehow, they were right. All right. 
Uh, I, I agree with that take, and this is one of the reasons Washington doesn't work. People take one stand and they don't keep it when the stand matters. And if ever there is a time for the Democrats to compromise, it's now. Because Donald Trump means it when he says he will start deporting people. Look, President Obama broke the law when he allowed DACA to take place. He did not have the presidential authority to do it. So what Donald Trump's going to do is enforce the law. The law is on the books. If the Democrats want to change the law, they need to compromise. All right, guys. Good to see you both. Good to Appreciate see you. it. A lot more coming up in this busy breaking news night. President Obama taking yet more swamp. The least racist person. The least racist person that you've ever seen. The least. I am the least racist person that you've ever met, believe me. To say, is Donald Trump a racist? I am the least racist person that you've ever looked at, believe me. The least racist person. The least racist person that you have ever met. I am the least racist person. I'm the least racist person that you've ever met. So many of my friends who are black, they say, you are the least racist person. But no, I am the least racist person that you have ever talked to. I am the least racist person you've ever met.